Okay, uh, <coughs> today uh, there is a shift in the <coughs> types of topics. Uh, up to now, we have been describing classical tools of uh, data analysis, <coughs> distances, ordination, canonical ordination, essentially, with everything uh, that uh, goes with it. And uh, today, <coughs> we will uh, focus on ecological questions today and tomorrow. And, of course, uh, statistics will come to our help to uh, better understand how ecosystems are working. But uh, the main focus will be on ecological questions. And today, in particular, it will be a beta diversity that will be the dominant uh, theme. Uh, and then uh, later, Daniel is going to <coughs> talk about the Mantel Curlogram. So, without further wait, if I can find my PowerPoint presentation, it's somewhere in there. Well, I can probably click here to find it. several versions of that uh, talk, so I must make sure that I start the r with the right one. Where is it? Yeah, this is the one. <coughs> I hope it is the right one, <laughs> because I have three versions of that. Uh, and then... Uh, yeah, this is just to show that uh, I also can present a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> for a change. <laughs> Actually, that started as a talk that I gave in 2013, and then I have given different versions of that same talk and adding uh, bits and pieces here and there. It is about the beta diversity and how to partition it in different ways. And at the end of the talk, we will see that this focus on beta diversity is uh, central to everything we are doing when analyzing multivariate ecological data. <clears throat> if, of course, the rows of our Y matrix uh, are sites in a, on a geographic map. <clears throat> so uh, this will give a unifying ecological theme to everything that we are doing. <clears throat> Uh, this is what I'm going to do uh, in this uh, first talk. I will remind you what are these notions of alpha, beta, and gamma diversities that you must have learned in elementary courses of ecology. <clears throat> but uh, that will allow me to uh, focus on beta diversity and show how it is very different from alpha and gamma. Then we'll see how to measure it, and we'll come to this uh, <coughs> this uh, way of measuring be total beta diversity and how it can be decomposed into spatial components here and species components. Then there will be an example that is the, the fish data of the Du River. And uh, here will be a more mathematical part where we will go back to the similarity matrices. And uh, there will be a landscape a genetics example. And here there is another final example that I hope you will appreciate. <clears throat> this is Robert Whitaker. <clears throat> he was a professor at Cornell University. And he has had major contributions to both ecology and uh, quantitative methods to numerical ecology. It is in his lab that Mark Hill developed the alternating algorithm that is at the base of the uh, Canoco program. Uh, Mark Hill also, in his lab, uh, developed the uh, diversity numbers that unify all the uh, alpha diversity measurements. <coughs> and uh, Hugh Gauch also wrote uh, one of the first textbooks of numerical ecology, uh, uh, all in his lab. 
So uh, he told us in the two famous papers in 1960 and 1972 uh, that uh, alpha diversity is, of course, local diversity. It is what you compute for, let's say, a vegetation quadrat or a water sample for plankton and so on. Gamma diversity is regional diversity. If you add up <coughs> everything in your data table, here's the Y matrix with sites and species. We can do the same thing with gene frequencies. If you add everything here, the columns, <coughs> and compute alpha diversity, the alpha diversity functions on this sum, we call it gamma diversity if the sites really are representative of the variation uh, in the region of interest. And beta diversity, he, he called it spatial differentiation. It is the variation in species composition among the sites. Does it vary from site to site? So uh, this may be clearer with the, the metrics, the same metrics that I was drawing here, where for each site we can measure alpha using any one of these uh, diversity numbers of uh, hill. And zero, for instance, is species richness. H1 would be uh, Shannon entropy, and uh, N2 would be uh, Simpson's uh, <coughs> uh, diversity. So if you apply that to uh, the sum, the <coughs> vector here, then you get gamma diversity. And as I was saying, beta diversity, we say that it is a variation in species composition among sites. To fix ideas, imagine that all the sites have exactly the same species composition like flower boxes that you may find along boulevards, at least in my hometown in the summer. There are flower boxes, and they are all made in exactly the same way by people in the botanical garden. I said in the summer because in the winter we have two meters of snow, and the flower boxes have been taken off. And uh, so if all the flower boxes are exactly the same, we may have alpha diversity in each one of these boxes. <laughs> There may be, for instance, five species of flowers present. But if they are all the same, there is no beta diversity. So this is to fix the idea that beta is of a different nature than alpha and gamma. You may have a large alpha diversity, but zero beta diversity. <coughs> and we will see that it can be measured in different ways. <coughs> uh, OK. There has been a lot of discussion during the past 10 years in the literature about these uh, notions. How can you measure beta diversity? And it turns out uh, this was uh, uh, pointed out in various papers, including this working group here that published a paper uh, led by Marty Anderson, uh, that uh, there are two major approaches to beta diversity. Uh, people who are working along some gradient spatial gradient, a transect, temporal gradient, a time series, or some environmental gradients like going up the slope of a mountain or choosing sites that represent a gradient in pH. Then if you have your data in this matrix for the different <coughs> the rows representing sites along this gradient, then if you compute a distance, one of our ecological uh, ecological distances like percentage difference or uh, jacquard if, you deal, uh, if you're working with presence absence data. Computing distances between adjacent rows is a way to <coughs> conceive beta diversity. And then you could plot the value of the distance <coughs> for different pairs along the gradient. Okay? This is between 1 and 2, between 2 and 3, three and four, and so on. And you could say, well, my beta diversity has done that, for instance. Okay? So you could look at the variation in these differences along the gradient. This is a nice and valid approach. Now, there is another approach that does not imply a specific direction. You can apply it to the whole map where you will be looking for a number that represents the kind of variation there can be across the map. And they are both valid approaches. 
despite the fact that some authors have claimed very strongly with a lot of energy that only that was true beta diversity studies. I disagree with that, and uh, it seems now to be the consensus that both approaches are valid. Now, in his famous 1972 paper, uh, what Whitaker told us, oh, by the way, it's, it's interesting that this paper, which is one of the foundations of modern community ecology, was not published in an ecological journal. It was published in Taxon, a journal of taxonomy, <coughs> uh, including numerical taxonomy. So in that paper, uh, <coughs> Whitaker de described two different ways of computing a single number for beta diversity. And he, that, he did that on two adjoining pages. Okay, on the uh, left facing page, he described this. And on the right facing page, he described that. And uh, here, uh, he said uh, that there were different ways of computing beta. And one of these ways was to use the uh, uh, alpha diversities com computed for the different sites and the gamma diversity computed from this vector using, for instance, species richness or Shannon diversity, and combining them as follows. S here, if you use species richness, it would be the number of, uh, the number of species in this vector. And uh, in the top, alpha bar, is the mean number of species in the different sites. So this ratio would indicate how many more species are present in the region than at an average site within the region. So that's a good measure of beta. And again, some authors have claimed that this was the only true measure of beta. But they have not read the next page of Whitaker. Uh, <coughs> so yes, indeed, it is a very good measure of beta. But it depends on alpha and gamma. Uh, now, uh, Whitaker, uh, then on the next page, said that if uh, we uh, want to, uh, <coughs> well, I will show that on the next slide, what he said uh, on the next page. Uh, what the concept that I'm going to use in uh, this uh, talk is that since beta diversity is the variation among the rows, well, I would be damned if the variance was not a good measure of variation. So I'm simply going to use the variance of the community data table as a measure of, the, uh, of beta diversity. You can use simply the sum of squares of the y matrix, as we were doing yesterday uh, to compute the r square of the, uh, in uh, canonical analysis, the denominator was the sum of square of the y data table. <coughs> you center the data square the values and sum them, and that's it. Uh, but then, if you divide by n minus 1, you obtain the variance. And this will be my measure of total beta diversity that I'm going to implement. And I'll show a bit later that this is exactly what pro uh, Whitaker proposed on the next page of his uh, taxon paper, except that he did that through a distance matrix. The advantage of this measure is that it is calculated directly from the data table, and it is independent of the measures that you can make of alpha and gamma. So across many studies, you can try and correlate this measure of, of beta to that measure of beta, for instance, because they are computed in totally different ways. It, it would be interesting to compare them. Now, there are many other indices of beta diversities available in the literature, but I will focus on that one because, as you will see at the end of this talk, it links everything that we have been doing since the beginning of the week, ordination, canonical ordination, variation partitioning, and everything, to the concept of beta diversity because in all these methods, we were decomposing the variance of this data table, which I claim today is a good measure of beta. OK, that's the main line of this talk. Uh, oh, yes, I will skip that in recent mathematical development. <coughs> uh, yeah, there is a slide that I had in one of the other presentations that is not here. But we will see uh, later 
uh, how uh, what was the idea of uh, Whitaker to in uh, computing this measure of variance from a uh, dissimilarity measure. Uh, I don't know. I <coughs> must have removed that slide for some good reason. Okay, now that we have this uh, community uh, data table Y, it is here again. <coughs> if we simply center the data and square them, so we'll, we'll obtain a new matrix that I call S, and uh, I show it explicitly because we will do some things directly with the S matrix. So it is simply an intermediate step in the calculation of the total variance as we were doing it yesterday, that is. You center the columns uh, on their mean, you square them, put them in there, and then if you add all these values as we were doing yesterday, the sum of all these values is the total sum of squares, and dividing by n minus 1 gives you <coughs> uh, the variance that I call beta. That's fine. Now, the <coughs> I will just make a few remarks on this measure of beta before coming back to that table and doing additional uh, yeah, calculations from it. Uh, the first remark is that, of course, we know that the Euclidean distance uh, <coughs> does not correctly uh, represent, is inappropriate for, uh, to, to measure the variation, the variance uh, on, in this data table because of the double zeros that may create, you know, uh, values that are completely inappropriate of the, when we compute distances. So it's the same thing for the variance. And uh, in practice, in studies of beta diversity, we should not compute these two equations, sum of square and variance, directly on the raw species abundance data, but we will should we should use the transformations that we discussed on Monday. That is the chord transformation, where each value is divided by the uh, the length or the norm of each row, or the Ellinger transformation, where each value is divided by the sum of the row and then square rooted. This these are the two. Uh, most <coughs> used transformation uh, before computing this total uh, variance. So I will uh, come back to the properties of these two distances, the, that is the chord uh, distance that we obtain by taking the chord transform date data and applying the Euclidean distance, and the Ellinger distance obtained by the Ellinger transformation plus Euclidean distance. I will come back to the properties of these two together with 15 other dissimilarity measures, their properties, uh, later during this talk. <coughs> uh, another note here is that this total value of variance, total beta diversity measure, can be used directly right now without further developments. In particular, if at the same set of sites, you measure the diversity of different taxonomic groups. Let's say uh, the, <coughs> the, the vascular plants, uh, the insects, the soil uh, invertebrates, uh, <coughs> whatever group you want to study uh, at the same sites, then you can compare the values of beta diversity among taxonomic groups directly because the, the measures of beta diversity that we obtain, I will show later that they, are, they have a minimum and a maximum. For instance, when we measure beta diversity using, after the chord or Hellinger transformation, for a data set, the maximum value of beta that can, we can obtain if all the sites have a different species composition is one. We have a measure no, uh, between 0 and 1. <clears throat> so this is very useful, and this is what makes it possible to compare <clears throat> among uh, taxonomic groups, because all the, uh, all the measures of beta uh, have the same minimum and maximum. And you can say then rightfully that, I don't know, the <clears throat> color opterans are more uh, <clears throat> beta diverse than the <clears throat> The, the vegetation or more diverse than the soil fauna and, and so on. So it's very nice to be able to make this comparison. 
Also, for a given taxonomic group, you can compare results from different areas <coughs> for the same reason, because the measures are comparable. And uh, they are measures of variance, where you divide by n minus 1, so that uh, it doesn't matter that you have a different number of uh, sampling units in area 1 and in area 2. This is taken care of by the division by n minus 1. And you can compare these numbers of beta for two areas, as long as the, the sampling units are of the same size or represent the same sampling intensity. Of course, if you sampled a small vegetation quadrat in one <coughs> area and big vegetation quadrat in the other, you cannot compare these. But if the, they, are, they represent the same sampling effort or same quadrat size, then you can compare them among study areas. This is already <coughs> something very interesting. So what I have done up to now is simply take the Y metrics, transform the species composition data, YTR, and produce this S metrics, where the, these values are centered and squared. So from that, we can compute this total sum of squares and total beta. As we go, we will fill the rest of this picture. Uh, the first thing we can do, well, let me come back here. It will be more simple. From this matrix, since summing all these values give us SS total, we can proceed first by summing each row here. Okay? And the sum of these row sums is equal to that. So if we now take these row sums and divide them by this SS total, we obtain indices that indicate the contribution of the different sites to the total beta. Okay? And all these indices sum to one, so they are a decomposition of total beta among the sites. This is what I show here in this slide. <coughs> I call them local contributions to beta diversity, and it is the row sum divided by SS total for each row, J, uh, I, excuse, excuse me, for each row I, you do that, you sum over all the species <coughs> uh, from this S matrix and divide by SS total. So these LCBD values, they turn out to be very interesting indices, as I will show in some examples later. They represent the degree of uniqueness of the sampling units in terms of community composition. If the, this community composition at one site is very different from all the other sites, then it will have a large value of LCBD. <coughs> now, I go back again. If we can sum by rows, we can also sum by columns. In the same way, the sum by column here will produce indices uh, indicating which species contribute the most to the beta diversity. And these values divided by SS total are, again, indices that sum to one over all the species. And so we have here the species contributions to beta diversity. These are the sums by column. And uh, the species with the highest values have high abundance at a few sites, uh, and that creates high variance. <clears throat> so here is a subset of the famous fish data that you have been working with this week. I chose here 11 sites and uh, seven species with their abbreviations as they were uh, until recently, until we, they were changed to English abbreviations. So uh, these are the data from uh, Vernot uh, at the University of Besançon, where uh, Francois Gillette is now working. So Francois dug out the, <coughs> the data from the, uh, the library and rechecked these data recently. <coughs> Uh, so here I chose these sites. Site number one is at the head of the river, and as you see, there is only one species at that site, and it is the brown trout, TRU for brown trout. And uh, the others are mostly uh, uh, minnows, cypreded fish. But, uh, are they all? Uh, <coughs> well, maybe not uh, com 
and not completely all of them. But anyway, you see that some sites have very few species. Also, these three sites have very few species, but not the same as there. And some sites have uh, pretty much all the species. So when we center these data, but, uh, these columns of data, the sites that have an average species composition will have values close to zero. And the sites that have extreme uh, distributions like that, well, the zeros become uh, high negative values after centering. And uh, so that, that will uh, create a row sum that will be uh, uh, then these uh, high negative values, when they are squared, they become high positive numbers. And then this row sum will have a high value because of that. It will be very different from the mean of, the row <coughs> of, uh, of all the columns. In the same way, these here will have high positive values uh, of the LCBD index because of that. So I did the calculations here after chord transformation of the uh, abundance data. And I obtained this for total sum of squares. And I divided by n minus 1, n being 11, n minus 1 is 10. And I obtained 0.53 as the <coughs> total beta diversity for this small data table. Uh, <coughs> this index, uh, as I mentioned, is between 0 and 1. So we have about half of the maximum possible value of total beta for this small data set. And here I computed the LCBD, local contribution, and SCBD. Instead of showing numbers, I show bubbles. And large bubbles are larger numbers. And we see that these sites have larger numbers, larger values than these sites here that are near, uh, near zero. So it means that after centering, uh, their values are very, very close to zero. And these sites uh, have very high values also. As for the species, the brown trout that is present at only a few sites and has many zeros contribute a lot to the total beta. And this is the ablet uh, uh, the <coughs> uh, that is a cyprinid, yeah. It contributes also highly to total beta. But then we will, here we know why this site is very special. It is uh, at the top of the river <coughs> in a very steep uh, environment, so only the trout can make it to there. But we will wonder why is it that we have uh, high contributions to beta for these three sites. We'll discover that a bit later. In the meantime, I will focus on the LCBD indices here. And the nice thing with these indices is that we can uh, sub subject them to a test of significance. <clears throat> that is, we can test the hypotheses that the values of LCBD at every site uh, are just uh, the result of random variation. <clears throat> and the alternative hypothesis is that these values are much stronger <coughs> then uh, they should be under the hypothesis of random distribution of each species across the sites. So we do that by permuting the, each column, species abundance in each column separately. This is an example of such a permutation. Here I put stupid numbers, but that are easy to follow, 0 to 9, 10 to 19, and so on. And I show a permutation column by column. So I take the values of the first column, permute them, and here they come in a random order. The values of the second column are permuted, third column, fourth, fifth column. Okay, And as you see, there is no mixing between the columns. It is just the values in each column permuted separately. The nice thing with R is that you can obtain the full permutation of from this to there with a single line of R. Look at that. We will apply to matrix Y by column the function sample. As you know, the function sample produces a random permutation. But here it is done for each column separately. So this line of code produces Y perm, that is this whole matrix. 
it is very easy to include that in a permutation loop. And then you can, <coughs> uh, uh, when you have this, you can recompute uh, the, well, the, the, the values, ha if they have been centered here, they are still centered. You simply have to square uh, the, the values and sum them. Uh, or you can even sum them and uh, square them. Then during the, after the permutation, you simply have to sum the rows, sum the columns. And <coughs> uh, you accumulate then uh, the, uh, the LCBD values for each site across all permutations. And at the end, you can compute the p-value for each row. It's very simple to do, and thanks to the uh, R language. Because of this uh, command here, you don't have to do a double loop to produce the permutations. OK, this is all and nice. What now, what do the LCBDs mean? This is an ordination <coughs> of uh, all the sites of the Dew River, except the site number 8 that, as usual, has been removed. And what you see here is that sites that have an average species composition would come out near the center here of the ordination plot, which is the centroid of the multivariate distribution. And uh, <coughs> then sites that are far away, uh, they are the most interesting ones. It means that they have species composition very different from this average site. And in this case, uh, in the example, the full example that I will present just after this, it turns out that site number one has a, a significant LCBD, and sites number 23, 24, 25 have significant LCBDs, but then after correction for multiple testing, these two are not quite significant. Uh, those that remain significant after correction for 29 simultaneous tests are 1 and 23. So the LCBD actually, as I will show a bit later, they are the square of the distance between the centroid and the uh, <coughs> position of the site in the principal component space, but in the multivariate principal component space. That's what they are, the square of the distance. So big numbers mean that they are far from the uh, multivariate centroid. That is not very interesting. It is the average site. But the interesting sites are those at the extreme. But they can be extreme for totally different reasons for totally different ecological reasons, as we will see in a moment. OK? So what I have done, we already had the skeleton here. I have added the LCBDs, that is the row sums divided by SS total, and the SCBDs, that column sums divided by SS total. And here, these can be tested for significance. We cannot test, uh, we have not found a way of testing the species contributions in that context. <coughs> uh, now, the full example is, of course, the fish uh, data from the Dew River, uh, available uh, on our site of the Numerical Ecology with our book, and available in the data sets provided for this workshop. With the full data set, then, again, after uh, <coughs> uh, chord transformation, I obtain a uh, total beta diversity of 0.54 uh, with the small uh, sample of 11 sites. I had 0.53, so I was not far from that. Here are some pictures. Uh, <coughs> Francois could probably comment better than me on this map. This is the Dew River. This is the head site here, number one. And the river flows like this, like that, like that. And finally, it uh, flows into the Saône River here that goes south. In Lyon, it means the, uh, with the Rhone, and they flow together to the Mediterranean. Okay. So here, the brown line is the border between France and Switzerland. So on part of its course, here, the river is the border. And uh, the, our sites are distributed along this river. And the city of Besançon, where Francois Gillette, oh, yes, this is Francois Gillette, by the way, <laughs> the third author of, <laughs> of uh, our book, Numerical Ecology with R. Yeah. 
proof of that? There's a, is there a picture? Oh, we have a picture of the three of us on the web page <laughs> as a proof of I identity. <laughs> so uh, Francois will uh, address you this uh, afternoon with uh, topics related to our main topics. So yes, Francois could comment because he lives in Besançon and uh, he has visited all these sites. Uh, <clears throat> So here I picked uh, some pictures from the uh, from the web. Uh, the at uh, the source here, uh, the uh, flow of the water looks like that. This steep slope, very rapid waters, and this is where we find the brown trout. Uh, in this area, the river flows in a nice uh, agricultural valley. It is it looks like an ideal place to take a vacation and so on. And in the middle of the city of Besançon, you told me this is a canal? Uh, no, no, no this is the, the river itself. Yeah. This is the river itself. It is uh, between uh, concrete banks in the city of Besançon. But then outside the city, it is, not, it is not like that. OK, so this is what it looks like. And here I made a schematic representation of the flow of the river with site one, blah, blah, blah. Besançon is around here. And this is the last site, number 30, <coughs> just before the river meets with the Saône River. And here are the LCBD values, represented by bubbles again. So the two that are significant are site 1 and site 23. But we see that sites 2 and 3 also have uh, pretty high values. And sites 24 and 25 also have high values, and we will uh, wonder why. <coughs> uh, for those of you who know uh, your fish species, this is the common bleak, uh, Albornus albornus, uh, that is found there. This is the uh, only species, I think, uh, found at all three sites. Anyway, it is the most abundant species. <coughs> Uh, in, at these three sites, while most of the other species have dis disappeared. And here we find, of course, uh, the uh, brown trout only at site number one, but then uh, the uh, uh, Foxinus foxinus and uh, <coughs> the, the, the stone loach uh, at, the, at these uh, sites number two and three. Uh, now, in order to determine what was the cause, <coughs> of these high values, I uh, <coughs> took the LCBD values here. So, so we can extract the LCBD values. And as you know, th we have a next matrix of environmental variables for the river, for the sites in the river. So I simply regress that vector on x. <clears throat> on all these variables in order to determine what were the most uh, important variables that determined the variation of the LCBD. So LCBD becomes a new variable, a new synthetic variable of the sites that we can now study with respect to the environmental variables. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> oh yes, we know that uh, two sites are significant. Uh, with this regression, I found that LCBD was positively, was positively related to the slope of the riverbed. And of course, that's what, that is why this <coughs> uh, site is significant. It's because only the brown trout can reach there because the water is too rapid. And then biological oxygen demand is also another significant uh, indicator of high LCBD values. And this is what happens in here. Going back to the data, we see that these three sites have high BOD. And this is a, <coughs> a commonly used indicator of water pollution. And indeed, at, in these sites, uh, there is agricultural pollution from fertilizers put in the soil by uh, the, the agricultures, the, the peasants. And uh, this, these uh, fertilizers flow into the river, create pollution, 
they favor the growth of algae that lowers the biological oxygen, that increases the biological oxygen demand, lowers the oxygen uh, available in the water, and makes the habitat uh, difficult for most species except this one and maybe one or two other species. Okay, so here we have the explanation of these high LCBD values and. For uh, interpretation of the LCBDs, we see that a high LCBD may be an indicator of a pristine site that could be included in uh, preservation uh, policy. I don't know, creating a natural reserve or something like that. But high LCBD can also indicate sites that have been polluted and are in need of restora uh, restoration. So LCBD is not significant, is not synonymous with a good site in ecological terms. It can be, on the contrary, indicator of a bad site in ecological terms. And so it is uh, up to you then to go back and see why these sites have these high LCBD values and act accordingly. But it is interesting to use these indicators because it tells us that if we have to look only at a few sites in detail, it will be this one and these three, instead of having, having to look in detail at all the sites. <coughs> LCBD is a good indicator of the, uh, of the fact that the site is interesting to look at in detail. OK, now I go back to more statistical uh, concerns. Uh, ah, yes, this is uh, the slide that I was looking for earlier. So on the right-facing page of his 1972 paper, Whitaker told us that beta diversity could be computed from a dissimilarity matrix. And he pointed out that indeed, for presence-absence data, we use, for instance, the Jacquard and Sorensen coefficient. These are the two that he mentioned. And we also use now the, also the OKI coefficient computed for pairs of sites. And the, for quantitative community composition data, uh, he mentioned the, uh, the percentage difference. He called it the brain curtis then. And uh, of course, the Ellinger chord chi square distance and many other distances that we will see in the table in a moment that we investigated in this paper. So he suggested to, come to take the whole dissimilarity metrics and take the mean of the dissimilarities as a single number index of beta diversity. He said, we compute this matrix, take the mean, and that's a good indicator of a good measure of beta diversity. OK, we will see how this connects to what we now know about dissimilarity measures. Uh, <clears throat> we, we know, for instance, I think I mentioned that uh, on Monday, but if not, you will see it here, that if the measure is Euclidean distance, for instance, on transformed species abundances, uh, then the total sum of squares that we can measure, and that leads to the total variance, the total sum of squares that can be measured directly from the, the data here, transform into matrix S by summing all the values in matrix S, can also be computed from the dissimilarity matrix. So I we can compute it from here, and we can compute it also from the distances if the distances are Euclidean distances. And this is done by taking the lower triangular of the dissimilarity matrix. So we take this portion, the portion that R shows us when we look at the dissimilarity matrix. We take all the distances in there, square them, sum them, and divide by n. n is not the number of distances. It is the number of sites, the number of rows here. Okay? And this gives exactly the same measure as that. It is not an approximation. It is exact decomposition, exact, exact way of measuring the total sum of squares. Uh, <clears throat> when we have the total sum of squares, then div division by n minus 1 gives us the total variance, which is our measure of beta. Now, I uh, discuss in a lot of detail the fact that most of the distance measures that we use in ecology, including Jacquard, Sorensen, percentage difference, 
and many others, as we will see, are not Euclidean when we take the distances themselves. And to make them Euclidean, we take the square root before going to principal coordinate analysis. If we do the same thing here and use the matrix D uh, with a sub-index uh, of uh, 0 0.5, in other words, the matrix containing the square roots of, the, of each distance value. And we know that uh, for all these coefficients, the resulting matrix is Euclidean. So if we put these values into that equation, we obtain this. Okay, So it is taking the sum of the distances divided by n to obtain total sum of squares, because each of these distances is the square, the square of the square root. Very simple. And uh, then this is what we do. We use this equation instead of that one for these coefficients here. And this will have some importance in, the, in this presentation and in the next presentation also, that for all our ecologically meaningful measures of uh, this similarity, we will use the square root. And this happens to be what we need to do to make them Euclidean. <coughs> so, uh, oh yes. Now, uh, this uh, ugly looking equation is actually the equation of centering in principle coordinate analysis. So I will temporarily quit my PowerPoint presentation and go back to this document where I showed you principle coordinate analysis. Uh, when was it? Uh, on Tuesday, I think. Uh, I showed you that principle coordinate analysis consists of taking a dissimilarity matrix. This is actually for, you remember the small example that I had uh, for PCA? Yeah. This small example here, okay? Two row, uh, two, uh, five rows and two columns. If you compute the Euclidean distance between these, you obtain this distance matrix. And here, I showed you that we first have to do this transformation, minus one half of d squared. And then we center the resulting matrix A here uh, by removing, by subtracting the row sum, the column sum, and adding the, the, the overall sum to obtain this matrix called delta. In my PowerPoint presentation, I call it G because this is known as the Gower centering. John Gower, again, the inventor of principal, component, principal coordinate analysis. So in this sense, uh, this matrix of centered data, these diagonal values are very interesting. And this was already shown by Gower in 1966, before you were born. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Here are the values that we obtain in the ordination. Compare these two things. <coughs> uh, yeah, I would have to show that these values, OK, last night I put them in a vector. These are these diagonal values here. And I took the square root of these values. And that gives us this. So I would need two screens to do that properly. So these values here. The first one is the coordinate. Coord the, 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 the distance of site number one from the origin. And it happens to be this value because in the ordinate it is zero. You see, it is exactly the same value. For sites number two and three, the distance is 2.6, like that. And you can obtain this value by taking these coordinates and putting it in the Pythagorean formula. Square each one, add them up, and take the square root. You will obtain these. And for these two, and this is the distance. So, <clears throat> in other words, what we obtain after Gower centering are diagonal values that indicate the distance of each, the square distance of each side from the centroid. These are our LCBD indices. Ah. So it is very simple to obtain LCBD indices from a dissimilarity matrix. You simply do this and the Gower centering, 
get the diagonal values, and there you are. So going back to my PowerPoint presentation, uh, where, where is PowerPoint? Here it is. Going back to the PowerPoint presentation, this is what I do. This is the matrix formulation of Gower centering, simply. Same thing as removing the row sum, the column sum, and adding the, the overall sum. You can write it in one line of matrix algebra in this way, where this is an identity matrix. These are, the, uh, one is a vector of one, so and so on. So this does exactly the same thing. It does the Gower centering. You extract the diagonal values with the function diag of g, divide by total sum of squares, and you obtain the LCBD indices. Now, if you want to test the LCBD indices in a function, you have to go back to the data, permute the data as we did with the raw data, recompute the distance, recompute <coughs> the, this uh, equation, the Gower centering, and obtain again the LCBDs under permutation. So the permutation loop is takes a bit more work on the part of your computer <coughs> uh, than working from uh, Ellinger transform data, for instance, but it can be done. And the function beta div that you will be able to work with this afternoon does that for you. Okay? It does permutation test of uh, <coughs> the, these LCBD values for any of uh, 21 the similarity measures that are available in the program. Okay. <clears throat> so this is uh, all very nice, and it makes us able to compute these indices, <coughs> the total beta diversity and the LCBD indices, either from raw transform data or from any one of our commonly used dissimilarity coefficients, and that's a nice thing. Uh, unfortunately, when we compute the dissimilarities, we lose the identity of the species. So we cannot compute the species contributions there. But I think the most interesting coefficients are the local co <coughs> contributions, and we can compute them here. Is that clear enough? Now, the range of values, uh, <coughs> it's easy to show that if there is no variation, and then uh, <coughs> the, the <coughs> if there is no variation, all the distances among rows when you go from this to a dissimilarity matrix, they are all zero. There is no variation. So to the total beta will be zero. If each site has a different species composition, whatever it is, this site has these species, next site has these species, and so on, if they are all different, then we have the maximum value of beta. And by putting <coughs> these, uh, these values for each type of coefficient, of this distance coefficient, into the distance matrix, we see that Hellinger and core distances have a maximum value of square root of 2. Did I mention that when we studied these coefficients? If not, and that's, that's the case. They are not between 0 and 1, these, co these two distances, Ellinger and Court. They are between 0 and square root of 2, 1.41, 42, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so if you put square root of 2 in this equation, here uh, by, for computing the, uh, the total variance, uh, then you put square root of 2 here, and it is squared and you put it in there, and you obtain 1. So this is why this coefficient between, uh, varies between 0 and 1 for Cord and Ellinger. Uh, in the next, on the next page, I do the same thing, but more quickly. For all the uh, distances that have a maximum value of 1 instead of square root of 2, and the same exercise shows that the maximum value is 0.5. Now, uh, Whitaker was using the mean of all the similarities, while in my way of computing the total variance, the proper way of reconstructing the total variance is to take the dissimilarities in half the of the matrix. 
So of course, Whitaker did not know all this algebra back in 1972. And this is why he suggested to take the mean of all the similarities, but his instinct was very good, excellent. And, but uh, as a result, he was obtaining twice the total variance instead of the total variance, as I do with my way of computing it. So if you want to reconstruct the total variance, we have to work with half of the distance metrics. But uh, since his values were twice that value, then the comparisons were just as valid. And this is why I claim that my way of doing the computation of total beta being the total variance of the data is quite consistent with what Whitaker was suggesting. <clears throat> OK, so our calculation summary now includes this portion where we go from y to a dissimilarity matrix and <laughs> computed from presence absence data, computed from abundance data with one of the coefficients. And from that, we can compute total sum of squares, and we can compute the LCBD indices, and we can test them by permuting this, recomputing that, and recomputing the LCBD indices, let's say, a thousand times or 10,000 times. Now, here is a rather <coughs> uh, difficult subject where we studied properties of dissimilarities. Everything that I have shown, uh, I will show you uh, the person in, in a few slides, the person with whom I did that, uh, young researchers from Catalonia. Uh, but <coughs> uh, when we did the, the, uh, the first part of that, we did it in about two weeks, two weeks' time, when we were working together in China. We had been invited uh, to go there and do a project. And uh, we had an apartment, and in the evening we had not much to do. Uh, we could have uh, listened to the news in Chinese, but uh, instead uh, we decided to work on this. And in two weeks' time, we solved all the mathematics that you have seen uh, before. But this part here took us three more months. It was a very difficult and long thing to do. So I will summarize that part. Here we studied uh, 14 different properties of the dissimilarity uh, functions. I have already mentioned a few properties when we looked at the metric and Euclidean properties of dissimilarities. What is necessary to make a function to be a metric is that it must have a minimum of zero and then uh, positiveness, that is the distances must be larger than or equal to zero, they cannot be negative. They must be symmetric and uh, to I think later down in the list, I mentioned the triangles inequality thing. OK. Now, other, property, other properties here. Uh, among the other properties, there is only this one that I discussed uh, in the uh, lecture on distances. That is the double zero asymmetry. And you know about that. You know that Euclidean distance doesn't have that property. <coughs> and this is why it causes problem with ecological or genetic data. So it means that the distance should not change when adding double zero, but it should change when adding double anything else. Uh, OK. Uh, <coughs> here, sites without species in common should have the largest distance. Uh, yes, uh, we should have that. But not all distances have that property. So you see that. A distance that doesn't have that property, or that one, or any one of those, actually, uh, should not be used for beta diversity studies. Uh, the distance here does not increase in series of nested species assemblages. Nested species assemblages means that if you start with a site having three species, then the next site has these three plus another one, and the next has uh, these uh, four plus two other species, and so on. If the structure is nested, uh, then uh, the, uh, the distance should not decrease when you uh, compute the similarities uh, pairwise. Uh, species replication invariance, this uh, was included as a mathematical property. That is, if you have the whole data table and compute the distance, then if you double it, you should obtain the same dissimilarity. This is just a, 
<coughs> mathematical property of stability in the calculation. This may be very important if you are working with biomass data. And we should have invariance to measurement units. That is, if you measure your biomass in grams or in kilograms or in pounds if you are in the U.S. or in uh, ancient measures of mass from ancient Egypt, uh, we should always obtain the same distance. Well, many of the distance, some of the distance functions do not have that. For instance, the Euclidean distance will produce a different number if your measurements unit, measurement units are different. So that's a very important property. And uh, the existence of a fixed upper bound. It's important to have a Dmax uh, for, to ensure that the measures of beta are comparable among taxonomic groups and among sites. Well, the Euclidean distance, again, is an example of a distance measure that, that doesn't have an upper bound to ensure comparability between data sets. Now, there are extra properties that are not essential, according to us, for beta diversity studies. And it is, for instance, invariance to the number of species in each uh, sampling unit, <coughs> uh, invariance to the total abundance in each sampling unit. And then there are uh, some corrections proposed by the Taiwanese uh, statistician An Chao that correct for undersampling. That is, they tried to estimate the value of the dissimilarity uh, while including the species that have not been observed because of sampling errors. It is a very tricky calculation, something that a mathematician, a good mathematician design, uh, An Chao. And uh, they, these coefficients can be very useful. Uh, there are three types of these coefficients included in the uh, beta div uh, function that uh, is available this afternoon. So only these three coefficients from An Chao have this property. And this can be useful. Uh, this solves a sampling issue that uh, small samples miss rare species. Uh, now there are ordination-related properties that can be useful. For instance, uh, we want to use a coefficient that is Euclidean or where the square root of the dis dis distances are, uh, make the matrix Euclidean. In that case, ordination with, by principal coordinate analysis will not produce negative eigenvalues and complex axes. And as we saw yesterday, when we use principal coordinate analysis as a method of transformation of the data before redundancy analysis, we want to use all the axes. So this is an important property in these circumstances. There are the similarity functions that are emulated, that are produced by transformation of the data followed by a calculation of Euclidean distance. And we saw these four transformations. They, they are those available in the function the constant of Wegen. They are the profile, Ellinger, chord, and chi-square. These four can be obtained in this way instead of computing from the distance function. OK, so we have 14 properties. So which of the coefficients have what properties? There we go. This is the list of coefficients that we investigated. There are more than those that I discussed on Tuesday morning. On Tuesday, I discussed the Euclidean distance, of course. I did not talk about these two. I'm, uh, when we talked about transformations, uh, Daniel mentioned species profile. We have the Hellinger transformation and chord transformation that leads, lead to these distances. Chi-square transformation that leads to chi-square distance. So these four are obtained by transformation plus Euclidean distance. Then we have all of these, and I think we, I insisted only on the percentage difference, Elias, Bruy, and Curtis. And then there are all these others that are commonly used in ecology. Uh, some of them are available in uh, Wegen, in the, uh, Weg, uh, what's it called, this Weg or the Weg this the function? Weg this function of Wegen. Uh, at least Canberra metric is uh, in there, this one also. Maybe not the Whitaker's index and Wishart. I think he has Kulsinski. And these are the abundance-based functions of An Chao 
that correct for uh, the uh, unseen uh, species. And here are all the properties. I did not list here properties one, two, and three because all the coefficients had them. So they were not, uh, uh, they were not discriminant. And uh, then uh, properties four to nine are those that are essential for beta diversity studies according to us. These are the additional properties. And this is the maximum value that can be taken by these coefficients, it's either square root of two or one, or in the case of this chi-square uh, distance, it has a maximum value, but it is square root of two times the, the total sum of the values in the data table. Uh, now, if we focus on this portion, we will eliminate any coefficient that has zeros. So we eliminate these four. And unfortunately, we have to eliminate the chi-square distance that misses this property, P5, that was uh, thought important. The others in the uh, blue-gray boxes are the coefficients that are admissible for beta diversity study. Now, uh, at some point, after writing this table, I stood back and looked at it and said, well, gosh, this looks like a data table. So why don't we do this. <laughs> and indeed, this uh, graph tells us something interesting. Actually, it turns out that all the coefficients, uh, the points are the coefficients, and the arrows are the, two, uh, the 14, uh, how many? Yeah, 14 properties that we saw listed. And all the coefficients on the left here of the ordinate are those that are eliminated. And all those to the right are those that can be used for beta diversity studies. And they are grouped into uh, one, two, three types on this side, and then two types on that side. Here we have the Hellinger and Cord that can be obtained through transformation plus Euclidean distance. These are regular <coughs> coefficients, the divergence, Whitaker, percentage difference, Kandra, Wachart, Kolsinski, uh, all there. And the type four are the uh, coefficients of Anchao that correct for the, uh, the species that we have missed. And uh, this tells us what are the coefficients that are admissible. And then, since then, I discovered another coefficient called the Rogiska dissimilarity, which is the quantitative equivalent of the Jacquard index and I had not heard about that until recently. And I checked its properties, and it is fully admissible also in the same group as all these others. And we will talk about, in the next, uh, my next presentation, I'll talk about that one and that one in more detail. But this one is another coefficient that is admissible for the beta diversity studies. And I have uh, programmed it and included it in the uh, beta div function that you will be able to use this afternoon. OK. <coughs> now, what we have seen are that there are, we have seen some of the ways of partitioning total beta diversity. And I mentioned here some other ways. Uh, we can partition total beta among species and among sites, the SCBD and LCBD indices. And this is new to this talk. Now, we know that uh, we can partition also the total sum of squares uh, using simple ordination or canonical ordination, PCA here, simple ordination, or redundancy analysis, canonical ordination. They are all ways of partitioning the total sum of squares. We know that the total sum of squares in PCA is partitioned into the eigenvalues. Uh, in canon in uh, RDA, it is partitioned first among the canonical eigenvalues and then the eigenvalues of the residuals. And, but altogether, they, they sum to the total beta diversity, to the total sum of squares. In a multivariate analysis of variance that uh, Daniel discussed yesterday, uh, using a, a single factor or two or several cross factor, we can partition our total sum of squares, again, into a portion explained by the factor and then residual, or between the two factors uh, and the interaction between them plus the residuals. 
So that's another way of partitioning total beta diversity. Uh, we, you, you have done variation partitioning yesterday and the day before. So you know that we can, again, take total beta diversity and partition it among two or three or four matrices of explanatory variables. Again, this is playing with total beta diversity. And tomorrow, we will describe the new methods of Morin eigenvector maps and associated methods that allow us to partition total beta diversity uh, among different spatial scales. We will, know, we will see that a part of the total beta can be explained by uh, fine scale, middle scale, broad scale, plus residual variation. And so this will be another way of partitioning beta diversity. In other words, everything that we have been doing up to now in numerical ecology, when our data represent sites uh, in a region of interest, everything is uh, our methods of partitioning total beta diversity. So it links numerical ecology with this fundamental and central concept of beta diversity in ecology. And I think that's also a nice uh, result of this, of this research. This work has been done with Miquel de Caceres, uh, who, <coughs> who has spent two years as a postdoc in my lab, and I worked with him uh, in uh, China uh, on this paper that was published in, in Ecology Letters. And the PDF is available, of course, on my webpage. Now, I think I will go through this uh, next example immediately, a landscape ecology uh, uh, landscape genetics examples. Data are from uh, Thomas Lamy here, who did his uh, PhD in Montpellier. Then he came to my lab as a postdoc. And as I was working on this presentation, I asked him, would you have some data that I could use to show that this same sort of calculation can be done on genetic data? And he said, oh, yes, I have my uh, thesis uh, data on this small snail that lives in uh, ponds in Guadeloupe. You know, Guadeloupe is actually, in the Caribbean, is actually two islands side by side. Uh, <clears throat> let's see how I'm, uh, this, this one on your left side is a volcano, and the other one is a, a coral bed that has been raised, uh, <clears throat> actually, when the, the water from the ocean went into the glaciers that are now melting. Uh, it, the, this coral reef emerged, and uh, this is the, uh, where most of the activity in Guadeloupe is. And these two islands are very close to one another, and there is only a small uh, <clears throat> portion of sea between the two, and people there call that the Salted River. It looks like a river, but it is actually the sea between the two islands. And there are two bridges between these, these two islands. Okay. So these uh, ponds are found in the uh, uh, ancient uh, coral, coral bed, where uh, ponds have been dug by agriculture, by uh, peasants, to uh, water the cattle and so on. So they try to keep the uh, <coughs> rainwater. But uh, some of these ponds, during the dry season, they dry out also. So what happens to the genetic? of these snails was the question that Thomas Lamy studied during his PhD, and he wrote very interesting articles, this one in Molecular Ecology, and another one in the American Naturalist, about uh, his data that are microsatellite data. He, here, uh, he studied 25 populations in ponds, rivulets, and swampy grass. Uh, for 749 individuals of snails were genotyped, he looked at 10 microsatellite loci, and then the mean number of allele per locus was 34, the mean. So some loci have three or four alleles, and others have 70 different alleles. So it is very high genetic uh, diversity, actually. And I did uh, transform the data using the genetic core distance, and I computed uh, total beta diversity, which was about 0.20 for a, <coughs> a maximum of uh, possible maximum possible value of one, and computed the LCBD indices. I make the story short. 
And here's the map of this uh, eastern island of Guadeloupe. Yes, the Salted River is here, <clears throat> just uh, adjacent to the uh, capital city of pointe à -Pitre. And so in these ponds here, we have uh, bubbles uh, that are uh, proportion whose size is proportional to the LCBD value. And the four bubbles that are in uh, brownish red are significant LCBD indices. So they are the most genetically unique populations, but then why? Again, uh, I had access to environmental data that had been collected by Tomalami, and uh, they were pond size, vegetation cover, connectivity, that is, is that pond connected to other ponds? Uh, temporal stability, it means essentially uh, does the pond retain water uh, during the whole year, uh, or does it dry out completely during uh, the dry season? And uh, <clears throat> that, was, that turned out to be a very important variable. Uh, here I used a regression tree, uh, as we saw during the talk on uh, Wednesday by our colleague. So a regression tree analysis, but it was regression tree for a single variable. That was the LCBD values that I was trying to uh, analyze, not uh, with the matrix of environmental variables, but not using linear regression equation. Instead, I used a regression tree. It turned out that the high LCBD values, or these four sites, were ponds where temporal stability was the lowest. That is, these sites regularly dry out. And connectivity was low with neighboring ponds. Uh, no connection, or nearly no connection, preventing migration of snails from adjacent areas. So how could snail uh, 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 remain in these ponds from year to year? These snails, some of them, can survive in the desiccated pond by a process called, known as estivating. That is, they just sit there in the mud uh, during the dry season, waiting for a drop of water to come at the end of the dry season. And some of them survive, but not all of them. So every year, there is strong, high mortality, so strong elimination of genes from the gene pool. So in the end, we have a much reduced gene pool in these ponds. And they are replenished. They are, cannot be replenished by snails coming from adjacent ponds because connectivity is, uh, is low, no connection. So some snails can move from pond to pond, carried by birds, for instance, that replenishes the gene pool, but only a little. And this is why these four sites have uh, very reduced gene, pond, gene pools, and hence they have these high LCBD values. So again, the LCBDs pointed to the sites where the genetic composition was very special. And uh, yeah, here I compare the uh, LCBD values to the allylic richness. And we see that indeed that these four sites, allylic richness was very uh, reduced. That is uh, 13, uh, <coughs> 13 allele per locus. 19, here 9, here 7, much reduced compared to all the other sites. Okay, so we can conclude that uh, beta diversity is the spatial variation in community or genetic composition among sites. It can be estimated in various ways, but here I focused on the variance as a general uh, flexible method to compute beta diversity. And it can be computed either from the raw transform data or from any dissimilarity matrix that is admissible to this uh, uh, calculation. At least now 12 dissimilarity coefficients are appropriate. I should correct that in my show slide presentation. It can be decomposed in various ways. And it links this concept links beta diversity to all the well-known methods of beta diversity analysis. Yeah, the first time I gave that talk uh, was when I received a prize, the President Prize from the Canadian Society of Ecology uh, and Evolution. And sometimes students wonder, what do you receive as a prize? Nobel Prize winners receive a million crores. 
what do you receive? Well, this is what I received. <laughs> a nice uh, sculpture of a salmon made by Indians from the west coast of Canada. Okay, 